you'll open up your Bibles to John chapter 13. <coughs> Don't look at uh, 1 through 17. John chapter 13, verse 1 through 17. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put, put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. What does it mean to serve others? I don't know if y'all realize this, but as of Friday, last Friday, the 20th, I've been your pastor for four years. Uh, November 20th was the anniversary that I started pastoring here at Gustin Baptist Church. Now, you all may say that uh, it's been good having me here as a pastor. Uh, I've done a lot of good things, but you know, there's a lot of things in my mind where I've fallen short, a lot of things that I wanted to do that I didn't do, and so I, I'm kind of my own worst uh, judge, I guess. Uh, I, I hold myself to a higher standard. But, uh, you know, pastoring, as I've always said, is an intense battle of the mind. I'm standing in the gap, I'm fighting for you all, and, and the devil doesn't like that, so uh, most of my problems are in my mind. He, he attacks my mind, and, and I've got to fight him all. It's a good thing that I've got the good Lord to help me fight him all, or otherwise I'd be devastated. But being a pastor is definitely a hard job, uh, and it's hard because we are required to speak the truth about sin and about the consequences of sin. And, and, you know, the consequences of sin of ignoring God's word. Uh, we're to preach God's word. I'll, I'll turn there. You don't have to turn there, but I want to turn to Ezekiel chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 16 through 21. And, and this is uh, Ezekiel talking. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the, that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I, re I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, 
he shall die because you did not give him warning. Uh, he shall die in his sin and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you have, will have delivered your soul. So there's a very strong message from Ezekiel to, I believe Ezekiel was called to share God's word, just the same as a pastor is called to share God's word today. And that's a very strong warning for pastors that take preaching the word of God lightly and they, they don't preach about sin and, and the consequences for sin. And I can tell you that if I take Ezekiel chapter 3 to heart as a pastor, you will never hear me sit back and preach fluff to, to fill you up with warm fuzzies every Sunday. I'm going to preach the truth no matter how much it hurts. No matter how much it hurts me to preach it, I'm going to preach the truth about sin and God's word. So Ezekiel was called to share God's message. And he did just that with uh, his people. But, you know, what we need to understand is why pastors preach so hard against sin. You see, it has eternal consequences. God's not playing a game with people. He's taking it very seriously. He's so serious enough that he sent his son to die on the cross. I, I think he's deeply concerned about the sin that goes on in our lives. And he wants us to stop sinning. You see, it has eternal consequences that uh, people will have to live with for the rest of all eternity. So we want to make sure that we're preaching everything that we can so that they'll turn to God before it's too late. But just, just as equally about preaching hard against sin, pastors, also we need to understand how important it is to minister to people. And I think in order to be a good pastor, you have to preach the truth. That's first and foremost. You, you're not going to be a good preacher if you're not preaching the truth, if you're not preaching God's Word. But the second thing that a pastor needs to understand is how to minister to people. So you, you got to be a good preacher, preach the word, and you got to minister to people. You got to care about them. Uh, and certainly Jesus was our example in our story today. Uh, Jesus was God in the flesh. He left his throne up in heaven, the, the glories of heaven, and he came down to live uh, a life as a human. And he did that his whole life. He did not commit sin. And yet he still humbled himself to serve. I think about God leaving glory to come down and serve us. Man, how awesome is that? But that's what God does. He cares about us enough to show us. Not only does he demand us to do things, but he shows us how to do it. And that's what a good teacher does. And Jesus was the best of teachers. But what, what would you say about my ministry here? Have I taught you, in the four years that I've been here, have I taught you to avoid sin and to care about other people, to serve other people? Have I taught you to love? Have you grown closer to God? Or have you grown further away from God since I've come here? Have you listened to the messages that I've preached? Or have you just punched your time clock? I did my time on Sunday. You see, Jesus humbled himself to serve his disciples in the lowest uh, uh, of low in servanthood by becoming uh, the person that, that had the terrible job of washing somebody's feet when they entered into the house. You couldn't get any lower than that. And that's what exactly what Jesus did. He became that servant to show the disciples how to serve in return. Now, where would Christianity be today? If the disciples took all that they learned and they ignored everything that Jesus said and they went out and they did whatever they wanted to do and they did not minister and serve to other people, where would Christianity be today? I don't know. But I know they were faithful to do what Jesus taught them to do and Christianity is where it is today because of their faith 
that they had in, in uh, serving Christ and serving others. So having said all that, let's look back at the example that Jesus uh, had of servanthood towards his disciples in verses 1 through 5. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. A few weeks ago, y'all had uh, the, the pastor appreciation video, and, and in that video, Kenny said to his interpreter, Wendy, if you'll remember, uh, that he had never seen a pastor wash dishes before. Hmm. My question would be, why have you not seen a pastor wash the dishes before? Why have you not seen a pastor serve in every capacity that he can? I don't know what the men have done before me, and I don't know what the men that come after me will do. But I can tell you one thing. Pastors are not above any of that. You see, if my Lord can come from the glories of heaven and humble himself and wash some dirty feet, then there's nothing that I can't do as a pastor. Every pastor needs to be serving like that. And I'm not patting myself on the back or any of that. I'm just saying, why are not pastors giving everything that they've got? And I can tell you that there's a lot of my pastor friends that are in this association. And I know that they're doing that and even more. You see, that's why I can say I know that I fall short sometimes. Because I know what my fellow pastors are doing. And all pastors should be doing that very same thing. Humble them, uh, themselves to, to serve the people that they are pastoring. And I can tell you that as members of the congregation, it doesn't stop with the pastor. It continues on with you all. We need to be ministering to other people, to each other, to the laws, to our co-workers, to, uh, as Tim was saying, to, to somebody that he pulled over. You know, ministry doesn't stop in church. This is not where it ends. This is where it begins. We are to take the ministry out of these doors and we're to care and love for people and to show them the Christ that loved us so much that he died on the cross. So why are we not doing everything that we can to honor our Lord? I can tell you, I am no better than Jesus. It's not even close. Jesus is so much better than me, but he was able to do it. I can do it too. And I'm not better than you all. You all are not better than me. You all can do the same thing. You can humble yourselves and serve other people. So what I'm doing is I'm asking you to examine yourself. I want you to inspect your life. I want you to see where God has brought you in the last four years that I've been here. How have you grown in your faith since I've been called to pastor this church? Are you better than you were four years ago? Or are you worse? If you're worse, if you're farther away from God than you were before I came, then let me ask you, is it the preaching and the teaching? Or is it the listening and obeying? You see, I can preach all day long. I can preach 12-hour sermons. But if y'all don't listen and obey, I, I, I can't do it for you. I, I'm only in charge of my life. I'm only in charge of myself. What God instructs me to do, I do my very best to do. You all are in charge of your life. 
And when he instructs you in his word to do something, it's your choice to say, yes, God, I'm going to do it, or no, I don't think so. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each other esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Amen. You see what Paul is saying is we need to be like-minded in Christ. We need to be like Jesus. We need to follow his lead in serving and ministering to others. What we don't need to do is be stubborn and confused by his example like Peter was. Look back at our scriptures in verse 6 through 10. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. You see, Peter was just like the other disciples. He wanted... He wanted everything. He wanted to do everything he could to please the Lord. And, and Jesus said, I've got to wash your feet. Well, he wanted to go the extra mile. <laughs> okay, Jesus said, wash my head and my body as well. You see, G Peter didn't understand what Jesus was doing. He was trying to teach him how to lead the church that he was calling him to lead. He was trying to teach him how to love people, how to serve people. And Peter just could not understand it. And sometimes we don't even understand what God is doing in our lives. Or where he's trying to take us. What he's trying to lead us into. We may not understand it at the time. But the thing that we need to understand is don't resist the spirit when he does lead you. Or where he leads you to be. Don't resist the spirit. Now I can tell you, if you're here today and you fully understand this book from cover to cover, you know every single word, you can memorize the whole Bible. If you know how every story applies to everybody's life, then I can tell you that you don't, you probably don't need to, uh, to come to church and, and to come to Sunday school and Bible study and prayer time and, and all these opportunities that God gives us to to grow closer to him. But I'm willing to bet. No, I'm willing to know that you don't know these scriptures. You know why I know you don't know them? Because I don't know them. I don't know it from cover to cover. I can't tell you every aspect of what God's trying to teach us in the scripture. That's why we come and listen to God's word. That's why we come to Bible studies and and, and get in a discussion and, and we grow together. You know, I, I can tell you I don't know hardly much, but y'all called me as a pastor. And as a pastor, when, when we do have those times of study, uh, we have good talks. And, and y'all teach me something while I'm trying to teach you something. You know, God's Word is, is given to us to, to, to look at, to study, and, and to learn how God wants us to be in life, but we don't always take advantage of it. Sometimes we're just plain stubborn. We're just going to do it our way. So let me ask you, are you willing or are you stubborn when it comes to what God is trying to do in your life? Let's look at verses 12 through 17. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. 
If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. All of the scriptures, from cover to cover, are never a suggestion on how you should live your life. All of the scriptures are a command in how you should live your life. You see, Jesus tells us what to do, and then says, you're going to be wise to do so. Why are we going to be wise if we do as he's commanded? Because it has eternal consequences. When we do what God tells us to do in the scriptures, our reward is heaven because we believe the scriptures. We believe Jesus died for our sins. We believe and we had faith. And our reward is eternal. It's heaven. Now in me as a pastor, just going back to Ezekiel, you're going to hear the truth from the scriptures. I'm never going to sugarcoat anything for you. I'm going to tell you as it is, exactly how God intended it to be. But it's up to you. It's up to you and you alone. To listen and obey. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the beauty of your word. We thank you for the treasure that it is. How it can shape our lives. How it guides us back to you when we get out of line. How it picks us up when we're down. How the word wraps its arms around us when we're hurting. When we're struggling and going through difficult times. Help us to take this word to heart and to minister to others as you have ministered to us. Help us to get back on track if we've gotten off out of line. Help us to take everything seriously, Father. Help us to love you like you deserve to be loved. Because you are worthy. Father, we give this invitation time to you. You speak to people's hearts. And Father, only you can tell them what they need to be doing. Father, we thank you. We love you and we 